Let's begin with prayer. Lord, we just come to these chapters, chapters 21 through 24 of Exodus, and we've been learning so many great things and so many analogies and so many truths as we've been looking at the deliverance of your people and, and all the things that they've done wrong and learning how we need to trust you. But as we, even last week, we got to see the giving of the Ten Commandments, seeing that they really encompass love. And, uh, but now as we come to <clears throat> a lot of these specific laws, we pray that, Holy Spirit, you would give us insight, instruction, and then some things that we could apply to our, our lives as we would travel through this section. So bless your word as you always do. You're so faithful. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we saw the giving of the Ten Commandments. And again, we, we talked about how important it is to remember that really these laws are motivated out of God's love for us. In fact, if we will love God, which is the first half of the Decalogue, we will love our brothers as ourselves. That's the second half. And we talk about the fact that the fulfilling of the law is bound up, Romans 13 in verse 10, in love. So if we would just love. We also establish the fact that, you know, man needed laws and needs laws because basic to our fallen nature is the fact that we need boundaries because if we don't have boundaries, we just, we go crazy. And we see this in our own children and then we become up to become adults and we need boundaries. We're, we're no different. And so God gives us boundaries. And as I said, we're going to see a lot of unique laws uh, this evening. Uh, there was a highway patrolman who spotted a car traveling 22 miles an hour on the freeway. You know, we need laws because sometimes we worry about people going too fast, but they were going too slow. So he pulled over the car and noticed that there were four old ladies inside of it. And uh, three of the passengers, they were, their faces were as white as sheets. And so the officer said to the three ladies, ma'am, uh, or ladies, sorry, are you okay? They said, yeah, we're okay. Then he asked the woman driving the car, ma'am, do you know why I pulled you over? She said, no, I have no idea. Why'd you pull me? She goes, you're going too slow. You're going 22 miles an hour on the freeway. Well, she said, I thought that was the speed limit. And he said, well, what would make you say that? Well, the speed limit side, it says 22 miles an hour. Uh, he was shocked and, in, in, you know, in the, her statement, he said, no, that's Highway 22. <laughs> Once again, he looked at the three ladies who were still, their faces were white as a sheet. And uh, he said, are you guys all right? And, they, and the lady driving, she says, no, everything's fine. We just got off of Highway 119, so <laughs> they're going to be fine. That's a dumb joke, but it proves the fact that we need boundaries. So that's what these chapters are all about. You know, we're going to see a lot of them. God gave actually 613 laws to his people. So if you want to study these in more detail, I'm going to peruse through them. You're welcome to do that. Get yourself a good commentary and enjoy. Um, but let's jump into chapter 21. Now, these are the judgments which you shall set before them. So now we're going to move into the laws concerning servants. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years. And in the seventh, he shall go out free and pay nothing. Now, there were various ways that a Hebrew could become a slave. One is he might indenture himself because he has no money, and so he puts himself in service as a slave to someone. Or a father might actually sell a child because of poverty. Or there might be bankruptcy, in which case the creditors put him into service as a servant until he pays it all back. Or if a thief was caught and he couldn't pay restitution, he would become indentured to a person until he pays it back. But here's what you want to understand. If there was a slave within the, the Hebrew culture, it was not lifelong. In the seventh year, after seven years, he was set free. Now, if he comes in by himself, verse 3, he should go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. So if he came in married, he goes out married. He could take his wife and children. If his master has given him a wife, though, and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. But, check this out, if the servant plainly says, man, I love my master, I love my wife and my children, I don't want to go free. Even though I have a whole family and I had to become a servant for a while, I don't want to go free. I love my master so much. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and you shall serve him forever. So an awl is just a big, like a, I guess we think of an ice pick, but those of us who are carpenters, you know what an awl is, just a, you know, just a big spike, essentially. You put his ear up and you just drive it right through. So when you saw a servant or an individual had a, a pierced ear, 
what that was is here's a guy who loves his master so much that he wants to serve him. It was what is called in the New Testament a bond slave, bound to the master for life now. And you know what? That's the term that the scriptures use all the time in regard to us being servants to Jesus Christ. I'm not a servant because I have to. I'm, I'm, I'm a servant of Jesus because I want to. I love him, right? Now, continuing, he says, if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, she shall not go out as a male slave does. So a woman had to be sold by her father, or if a father gave her to be a man's wife, and this was a way of providing if they were very poor. If she does not please her master who has betrothed her to himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has dealt deceitfully with her. Oh, I'd like to have this woman, you know, but he doesn't. Um, if he's betrothed her a son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of daughters. So the idea is here is that even within uh, Hebrew slavery, because of poverty, God had protection for them. Now, if he takes another wife, if he divorces her, he shall not diminish her food, clothing, or her marriage rights. In other words, he'd have to provide for her. And if he does not do these things for her, then she shall go out free without paying money. So God didn't want women degraded, even if they were poor and had to be indentured as a slave or even as a wife to such a person. Now, moving on, laws concerning capital punishment. And these, by the way, are the logical laws from the sixth commandment. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. However, he did not lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hands. In other words, he was killed accidentally, manslaughter. Then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee. But if that man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar and that he may die. So capital punishment goes all the way back even before the law to Genesis 9, 6. Whoever sheds a man's blood by man's blood, he shall be shed. So God says, you know, the murder must be put to death. Now, I just was thinking about this. We call ourselves a nation under God, but there's not a large city in the United States that, you know, doesn't have a murder or several murders a week, some even every single day. And then I think about our nation, how we've murdered unborn children through uh, abortion. And God takes seriously premeditated murder. And so I have to think, wow, what does God think of us as a nation? You know, we need to be interceding for our nation, standing in the gap. I mean, you know, God, I, you know, sometimes we feel like God is punishing us. And I say, yeah, there's a lot of punishment going on for our sins. Now, for manslaughter... Um, and if it was accidental, he would set up, God will go on, and we'll see this in future, future chapters, cities of refuge. We'll talk about that in the future. But he who strikes his father or mother, verse 15, shall surely be put to death. This upheld the fifth commandment, of course, of honoring mother and father. And he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. That's a... Uh, uh, Dealing with the Eighth Commandment. Again, all these men really come out of the Ten Commandments that were given earlier. Kidnapping, that's stealing a person, right, in the image of God, right? So God takes kidnapping in a serious way because made in the image of God, it's the death sentence. And then, again, coming back to the Fifth Commandment, he who curses father or mother shall surely be put to death. That's a heavy commandment, right? I bet there weren't a lot of disobedient children back then. <laughs> See, why don't I pin that up on your refrigerator? Hey, kids, check this one out. Anyway. <laughs> Personal injury, injury laws. Verse 18, if, the men, if men contend with each other and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist and he doesn't die but is confined to his bed, if he rises again and walks outside with his staff, then he who struck him shall be acquitted. He shall only pay for the loss of his time and he shall provide for him to be thoroughly healed. So if there's this fight and a guy's injured, he has to be compensated for his time and, and, and also taking care of the bills. Pretty straightforward. And then it says, if a man beats his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. So again, uh, even servants were protected within the Hebrew culture. Notwithstanding, if he remains alive a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his property. So the idea is that is if the servant lives, the fact that you know, he couldn't work uh, he was injured, the idea would be the equivalent of the master paying rep, uh, restitution. But the, but the idea of what you want to see is that 
the only time someone was made a servant was because they were poor, they needed to pay back, and God protected them. Then we have, again, all these unique laws. If, if men fight and they hurt a woman with child, I don't know why they put that there, but they do. So she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows. He shall surely be punished accordingly to the woman's husband what he imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judge determines. So if a woman's hurt, and, but the baby's all right and everything, everything's okay. Just pay for damages and so forth. But if any harm follows, maybe there's a miscarriage and so forth, then you shall give life for life. And now he moves into this familiar injunction. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Now, there are those who criticize the law saying, man, that sounds pretty barbaric. And you might think that at first, but in reality, this law was actually put here as a protection. This law was actually established so that when the law was meted out by the judges... The crime wouldn't be more than, it, than or the punishment would be more than the crime deserves or less. So, because here's what I want you to say. It is innate within man's nature, and there's that tendency to actually want to give more punishment than what the other person deserves. In other words, you hit me in the eye, I'm going to hit you in both eyes. You knock out my tooth, I'm going to knock out all your front teeth. Do you understand that? That's, that's the human nature. So... The idea is that this, loan, this law became known as lex talionis. Let the punishment fit the crime. So let me also say this, and this is important. None of the punishments here were, in, the, in any of these chapters, were to be exacted by the person who was harmed. It was supposed to be appointed to judges, and the judges would do it. It's interesting because by the time of Christ, the, the, the Jewish teachers actually taught that if someone pokes out your eye, you're actually obligated that you have to poke out their eye, and so forth. And it wasn't even taken into the courts. It became crazy. But that's why Jesus kind of said to him, you've heard it said, uh, you know, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I say, if a guy slaps you on the face, give him, give him the other cheek. Go ahead. You don't need to exact punishment. Now, he says in verse 26, if a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant and destroys it, he shall go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of a male or female servant, he shall let him go free for the sake of his tooth. So again, regarding servants, if, if you do something to them, they go free. How about that? Now, if an ox gores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall surely be stoned and its flesh shall not be eaten. Don't even eat it for, you know, steaks. But the owner of the ark shall be acquitted. So his ox killed somebody, hey, it's got to be put down. But if the ox tended to thrust with its horns in times past, in other words, it had a tendency. It, it had tried to do that to someone before and has been known to his owner and he has not kept it confined so that it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned and it's also, also put to death. How about that? If there is imposed on him a sum of money, then he shall pay to redeem his life whatever is imposed on him. Whether he has gored a son or gored a daughter, according to this judgment, it shall be done to him. So it's letting the punishment fit the crime. So, you know, we, we've seen this probably in our own society. You see some dog bite somebody, you know, and it was an accident and it happens. We've also seen cases where you've had a dog that's attacked somebody two or three times. And now it does harm to a person. Well, then not only should, you know, the dog be put down, but now that owner needs to, you know, deal with some of that punishment because of it. That's exactly what this law is saying. Verse 32, if the ox gores a male or female servant, he shall give their master 30 cycles of silver and the ox shall be stoned. Then concerning negligence, if a man opens a pit... Or a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls in it. The owner of the pit shall make it good. He shall give money to their owner, but the dead animal shall be his. Now, Israel is a, an agrarian society. Animals are their livelihood. So if my negligence causes you to lose your animal, well, then I have to give you one of mine. And if a man's ox hurts another so that it dies, and then they have to sell the live ox and divide the money from it, and the dead ox they shall also divide. So proper restitution. Or if it was known that the ox tended to thrust in times past and its owner has not kept it confined, he shall surely pay ox for ox. The dead animal shall be his own. So, sorry, these are just, just you know, cra crazy laws, but we're covenant through it. Chapter 22, personal property. 
animals, crops, and so forth. If a man steals an ox or a sheep or slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. So you're giving restitution of 20% or 25% um, more. Well, actually, that's more than that. That's even a greater amount. Uh, just the opposite of that. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck, we like this one in Texas. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. All right? So you break in, you do it at your own risk. Even God said that's right there. <clears throat> All right. If the sun has risen on him, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. He should make full restitution if he has done nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the theft is clearly found alive, a thief is found alive in his hand, or if the theft is certainly found alive in his hand, in other words, what he took, whether it's an ox, donkey, or a sheep, he shall restore double. So if the thief stole some, double restitution. If a man causes a field or a vineyard to be grazed, and lets loose his animal, and it feeds in another man's field. He shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. So you don't want to do that. If fire breaks out and catches in thorns so that it's stacked grain, standing grain, or the field is consumed, he who kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. If a man delivers to his neighbor money or articles to keep, and it is stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges to see whether he has put his hand into his neighbor's good. Hey, we didn't find the thief. Maybe you did it, dude. <laughs> For any kind of trespass, whether it concerns an ox, a donkey, sheep, clothing, or any kind of lost thing which another claims to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whomever the judges condemn to pay double to his neighbor's. Again, the people were not supposed to take the law into their own hand. It was going before the judges. It's going before a case. If a man delivers his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or an animal to keep, and it dies, is hurt, or driven away, no one's seeing it. So no one knows what happened. Then an oath of the Lord shall be between both of them, that he who has not put his hand into his neighbor's good, and the owner of it shall accept that, and he shall not make it good. Now, here we have the basic premise, and this is where we get it from our law, that a person is innocent until proven guilty. So what you have in this case is a, is a, is a man asked his neighbor to take care of one of his animals. And while he was gone, the animal got loose or died. And there's no evidence to show foul play. So what you have, he asked him, did you do anything? No, I didn't. You have to take his word on it. If there's no evidence, then he is presumed innocent until, until proven guilty. But in, in fact, though, verse 12, it is stolen from him, and then he has to make restitution to the owner of it. If it is torn in pieces by a beast, it was killed, then he shall bring it as evidence, and he, shall not, and he shall not make good what was torn. And if a man borrows anything from his neighbor and becomes injured or dies, the owner of it not being with it, he shall surely make it good. If its owner was with it, he shall not make it good. If it was hired, it came for its hire. So personal property, restitution. Now, 16 through 27, you have moral laws. If a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall surely pay the bride price for her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuses, though, to give her to him, he shall pay the money according to the bride price of virgins. Now, we've talked about this before. In ancient times, the father of the bride was paid a dowry by this individual wanting, you know, his daughter to be his wife. He pays this prenuptial. And we remember back in Genesis 24, remember Eliezer was sent on that task by Abraham to find Isaac a wife. And when Eliezer comes uh, to Rebekah's family, he comes with 10 camels loaded down with the goods. And when she says yes, he, he gives all of that to her and the family. That was the dowry. Now, this passage here is actually a deterrent against premarital sex. It emphasizes the fact there is no such thing as casual sex and that sexual relations really carry lasting consequences. Verse 16 states that if a man lies with a virgin, he must marry her and he must pay the price of the dowry to the father. But here's the other problem. If the father says, no, I don't want it. The guy's a crumb. I don't care. He's still going to pay me the bride price and I'm not going to give her to be, you know, her husband. Well, the man must still pay the bride price, right? But here's the problem. And the reason why he does, because within that culture, 
because she was violated or she went to bed with him, most likely she'll never marry again. That, in that culture, it just wouldn't happen. She had lost her virginity. That was it. Again, proving the fact that sexual sin has consequences on both parties. Now, more moral laws with capital punishment. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. In uh, Galatians chapter 5, it's interesting. In the New Testament, we have a list of all these radical sins, fornication. The works of the flesh are fornication and, and adultery and lewdness. And it includes in their sorcery. They say sorcery, even in the New Testament. Well, yeah, because the Greek term that we get sorcery comes, the Greek word is pharmakia. And that should sound familiar because we get our term pharmacy from it. And that's because all of the pagan worship was occultic and always involved mind-altering drugs or alcohol and so forth. So God says, I don't want that associated with my people. And if they do that, they'll be put to death. Pretty radical. Then verse 19, whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. I don't even know why you have to put that one in there. <laughs> right? But that was going on within the pagan cultures of that society. God says, I don't want that happening amongst my people. If they do, they're put to death. And he who sacrifices to any God except the Lord God only, he shall utterly be destroyed. So to break the first commandment, death penalty. Three capital crimes, sorcery, bestiality, spiritual adultery. Now we have moral laws concerning the poor, the weak, and the stranger. And I love God's compassion here. God cares about the defenseless, the poor. You shall neither mistreat a stranger nor oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You, you treat strangers kindly. Don't you remember? You were nothing. You were poor. You were slaves. You had no culture at all. No laws, no culture, no nothing. You just did what your masters told you. And I had compassion on you, and I made you a nation. You were strangers. Now you love strangers. He adds also, you shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. I have found and noticed that charlatans usually go after these kind of people. They go after the people that are down. They go after the widow who has nothing, who's looking for hope. They go after the fatherless child. Or they go after the elderly that's dependent on something else. They, they prey on them. God says, if you afflict them in any way, verse 23, and they cry out at all to me, I'll surely hear their cry, and my wrath will become hot, and I will kill you with a sword. Your wives shall be widows, and your children will be fatherless. How you like that? Wow. <laughs> be good. <laughs> then God addresses the poor. If you lend money to any of my people who are poor among you, you shall not be like a money lender to him. You shall not charge him interest. Now, there's nothing wrong with charging interest to someone who has the money, someone who needs a loan, but not to the poor. Not to the poor. They don't have anything. In fact, he says, if you take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, in other words, you're going to loan something, but the only collateral he has is the shirt on his back, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down, for that's his only covering. It's his garment for his skin. What will he sleep in? And it'll be that when he cries to me, I'll hear, I'm gracious. So you need to be compassionate to those who don't have anything. And sometimes, you know, we go, well, that person, he's probably just going to get some booze or they're just doing this. Well, you know what? Let God deal with that. But when you see someone who doesn't have anything, help them. He says, you shall not revile God. Again, that's, that's the third commandment, not taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. Nor curse a ruler of your people. How about that? When God puts someone in authority... Romans chapter 13 says, everyone who's in a place of authority, God has placed them there. Therefore, don't curse them. Pray for them. We need to pray for the rulers of our nation. We don't need to curse them. We need to pray for them. And God says, I I'll deal with you if you curse them. God says, that's, that's against my heart and my law. You shall not delay to offer the first of your ripe produce and your juices, the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. Likewise, you shall do with your oxen and your sheep. It shall be with its mother seven days. On the eighth day, you shall give it to me. So here we have the law of first fruits, the first fruits of the ground or of animals or the firstborn son was to be given to the Lord. Now, both produce and animals were to be sacrificed to God in offering. But then in regard, if you were the firstborn son, you had to be redeemed with an animal sacrifice. And why was that? Well, because God redeemed and spared the firstborn when he brought them out of Egypt. God was reminding them that. By the way, 
though we don't have to obey this law, Christ has fulfilled the law, there is a principle here in the fact that all of us are a sacrifice to God, right? All of us. Because we're, not, we're all in one sense the firstborn because we've all been born again. And because we're born again, Romans chapter 12 tells us as children of God, he beseeches us by the mercies of God that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, which means the best, which is acceptable to God. It's our reasonable service. Then finally he says, you shall be holy men to me and you shall not eat meat torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. And this was really for two reasons. It was ceremonial and it was hygienic. It was ceremonial because the, an animal that was, you know, that was killed in the field would most likely have its blood in it. It wasn't killed the proper way and that would be wrong for God's sacrifices. And of course, a carcass laying around could have disease and it was hygienic. God wanted to protect his people. All right, chapter 23, and we're going to try and get through here, I promise you. You shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Man, God wants his people of integrity. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. So you put these two together, and God is saying, don't hang around people that just want to give false reports. Don't be with them. Stay away from them. Don't be an unrighteous witness. I like what one commentator said. He said, it's the nature of man to follow the crowd to do evil since the time of Adam followed Eve into sin. This is why it's important for us to choose the crowd we hang with carefully. Amen. I remember my parents telling me that all the time. Choose wisely, Ron, who you hang out with. And, and then they would say to me, who you hang around, you'll become. So why do you want to hang around people that are just, you know, talking about other people all the time or just talking down about everything all the time? I mean, or, you know, doing the wrong things. God doesn't want us doing that. You shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. How about that? That's interesting. Because that's the flip side of taking advantage of the poor. He also says, don't use bad judgment saying, well, because he's poor, he's going to win the case. That's not wise either. Verse 4, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under a burden and you refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. So that's a basic law of kindness, but that's not easy, right? This guy hates you, been talking about you, been trashing you, you know? And then you see his ox laying on the side, you're like, too bad for him. <laughs> for both of them, you know? <laughs> the ox and the owner. No, you got to help him. And of course, Jesus talked about loving our enemies. Man, that's hard, right? And then we have the story of the Good Samaritan. I mean, you have a Jew who's beaten up and left on the side of the road, and a Levite walks on the other side, his own kind, says, man, I don't want to hang around that guy. He must have done something wrong. And then it tells us that, uh, you know, a priest comes by, a righteous dude. Yeah, self-righteous dude. Oh, I don't want anything to do that. But a Samaritan comes by, one who was mistreated by this guy, and he comes and he helps him. Man, that's to be us. We're to be the good Samaritans, right? Loving those who are unlovable. You say, that's impossible. You're right. In our flesh it is, but not with the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, you shall not pervert the judgment of the poor in his dispute. Keep yourself far from a false matter and do not kill the innocent and the righteous, for I will, justify, I, for I will not justify the wicked. I, I think that's our justice system today, unfortunately. You know, we you know, call right wrong and wrong right. I, I do still believe that our court system is the best in the world, but it is far from perfect. And we've seen people that were righteous, you know, arrested, even their lives taken. It's horrible. <clears throat> and you shall not take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. So bribes lead to lies, perjury, perverting righteousness. And God reiterates what he stated in the last chapter in verse 9. Also, you should not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Then Sabbath laws. Six years you shall uh, sow your land and gather in its produce. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat. How about that? Leave the, let the field go, and then all the poor people need to go in, and they need to they glean your field, eat everything they want. Isn't that cool? I love that. God cares. 
and what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner, you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove. So the Sabbath not only dealt with each day of the week, one day of the week, but it also dealt with every seventh year. You let the land rest. And when we were in Israel just this last year, it was the Sabbath rest. So you saw, oh, a half of the fields left unattended, maybe, maybe half, maybe about 40%. So that just tells you where the Jews are today. 40% are like, we're going to obey the law. The other are like, no, we need the money, you know, and they're still tilling the land. But understand this, that the children of Israel, once the law was given and they moved into the promised land, they did not follow this law for 490 years. So we get to the time of Babylon coming in and taking God's people of Judah from Jerusalem. And Jeremiah the prophet says, you will go into captivity 70 years. Why 70 years? Because he says, for every year you did not obey, for those 490 years and you didn't keep the Sabbath year of rest, you'll go into captivity for this very command. Verse 12, six days you shall do work. On the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox, your donkey may rest, and the son of your female servant, and the stranger may be refreshed. <laughs> said to you, be circumspect, in other words, mean be alert, and make no mention of the name of other gods, nor let it be heard from your mouth. So these are laws. Now he talks about three feasts. Three times you shall keep a feast to me in a year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I command you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. For in, you, for in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, of course, the Feast of Passover went along with it. But the Passover would begin on the 14th day, and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread would be the next seven days. And, of course, leaven, which is yeast, uh, in the Bible represents sin. Because it is yeast that is put into bread, it is through its fermentation, its, you know, well, your decomposition, that it causes the bread to bubble and then expand. So that represents sin. That's how sin is in our life. We allow a little bit, and if you don't get rid of it, it expands, right? And you get worse. You turn into a monster, right? So we have to deal with it. And so we need to get the leaven out of our life. So this was a time where they were to rid their house of, of leaven as to have seven days of purity. In Galatians 5, 9, Paul says, don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Just a little sin defiles our lives, and so we need to take heed to, uh, to that spiritually. Now, secondly, they were to observe the Feast of Harvest, verse 16. And the Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field. Now, this was the feast called the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Harvest. We also know it as the Feast of Pentecost. And it would be here that the people would offer the first fruit of their crops. And of course, in Acts chapter 2, we know that it was on the day of Pentecost that the church was birthed, and that is the first fruits, the very first believers, the first fruits of the church were birthed. And then thirdly, they were to observe the first of ingathering at the end of the year, when you've gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. We also call this the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, or Sukkoth. And so the children of Israel were to make these booths out of palm trees and so forth, and they would live in it for a week outside of their homes. And it was a reminder how God had provided for them when they were in their wilderness wanderings. And I've been over to Israel during the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, and you'll see people make them outside of their homes. And if there are some Jewish people live in a, uh, an apartment complex, and they just go out on their balcony, and they put a little, a little hut hanging out of their balcony, and I guess they go and hang in it. You know, so it was celebrating that. Three times a year, these feasts, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until morning. The first fruits of your land shall bring in, you shall bring into, your ho into the house of the Lord your God. And then we read this strange part at the end of the verse, very important. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Now, I would underline that. I would mark, make a mark there because you think, well, that's just an interesting, obscure passage. Yes, but if you go to Israel, you will deal with that verse every single place you go. As obscure as it is, Orthodox Jews today deal with this. Um, this is a result of this verse that no kosher 
or uh, biblical Old Testament law. No kosher establishment will serve you meat and a dairy product together. So at a kosher place, you can't get a cheeseburger in Israel, which is a bummer. You can't get meat and have cheese on it, a dairy product. A, a dairy product. Why is that? Well, rabbis argue that the meat of the hamburger may have come from the calf of the cow that gave the milk, you know, that made the cheese. And as the cheese, if you eat the cheeseburger, as the cheese is being digested in your stomach and it's being churned into milk and it comes together with the meat that you swallowed, it's being boiled together in your stomach and therefore it's a violation of this law. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but that's the way it is. And... So you have to deal with that when you're over there. So you can sit at a table and there you have bread, you know, but there's, there's, no, there's no butter, you know, no butter. What? You know, that's a bummer. But now you can understand why Jesus said to the religious leaders, you strain out a gnat. You're so meticulous with all these laws. You strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. And you miss the whole point of the law which is to bring you to Christ. In fact, when we get to the book of Galatians, the New Testament, God's, uh, Paul is asking a rhetorical question. He says, why did God give the law? He gave it to be a tutor, a tutor for us that would drive us to Christ. In other words, that we would see the law, that we're desperate without God. We can't keep all these crazy things and we need Jesus. That's the whole point. Now, God talks about his protective presence and blessing of obedience in the remaining verses. Behold, I will send an angel, notice capital A, before you to keep you in the way and bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Capital A, we've talked about this before. This is a Christophany, a pre-incarnate visitation of Christ. Jesus did not come into existence in Bethlehem. He was born as a man in Bethlehem. But God has always been. Jesus has always been. John 1.1 1, 1 gives us the, the really manifest of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Speaking of Jesus. So, throughout the Old Testament, Jesus is often referred to as the presence of of the Lord. And of course, we know that no regular angel can pardon sin, but Jesus can, as it says in this passage. So God tells his people in verse 22, if you obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you. And again, it was Christ that went before him in the pillar of fire, right? In the cloud by day. And he'll bring you into the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, Adesites. And he'll cut them off. And you shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. So you shall serve the Lord your God. In other words, put God first. And as you do, he will bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come. And I'll make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. Interesting, there have been some arguments. Was this real hornets that God sent out at a certain time? Maybe so. I remember my wife and I were just watching a, a, a Christian a video of a, a band that did a song on this very thing, hornets being sent out and the power of God. I was like, yeah, that's kind of cool. That's that verse right here. But notice the blessings and the rewards of obedience. If you're obedient to me, I'm going to bless you big time. And it makes me wonder if when I read this whole list, I, I, I've read this many times this week, and every time I've read it, I've had the same thought. God, is this why we have all this stuff in our nation? So much sickness, so much disease, so much ho horrible things. Is it because we've been turning our back from you? Maybe. Samuel, the prophet, said to King Saul, remember Saul had blown it time and time again. But Saul was like, oh, I'm going to offer to God. He didn't really live it, but he'd go through the, the religious gymnastics. And in 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel said to Saul, has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices than in obeying the voice of the Lord? He said, behold, to, it is better to obey Saul than to offer sacrifice. 
God doesn't care about your religious gymnastics. He wants obedience. So that's what God was talking about here. Now, <clears throat> he adds to him. Now, I'm not going to drive out all these people in the nation that you're going to take over in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you've increased and inherit the land. So this is kind of interesting. God says, you know, I'm going to give you the land, but I'm not going to do it immediately, little by little. I have found that God does this in my life too. I would like everything right away, please, God. <laughs> I like, right? But he doesn't do that. I mean, I like, I like this part that I hate about me. Oh, I hate this. God, just take it out of my life. And he doesn't like, bing. I'm like, awesome, victory. No, it's little by little. You have to work. I have to surrender that to God and, and be obedient. And he begins to little by little to work it out. And so it's, it's trusting him day by day. He adds verse 21, or 31, I should say. I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the Sea of Philistia, from the desert to the river, for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and I will drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest you make, they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. And so stay clear of all these other gods. And of course, we know that in their history, they did not do that. Now, Chapter 24. So you didn't think we'd make it. We're going to make it. Now, as we come to this chapter, God is going to ratify his covenant with the people, which is another radical chapter. Now, he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nabab, and Abihu, and 70 elders of Israel with you and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come up near the Lord. So you bring these guys, but they can't come as close as you, Moses. You come to the top. They shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with them. So Moses was going to come to the top and the, some of the leaders along with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice said, all the words which the Lord has said, we're going to do. And Moses wrote all the words uh, to the Lord, of the Lord. So, but here's the thing. Again, we saw this time. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. And of course, they didn't always do it or do it or do it, right? But I think it was good. They, wanted, they had a good intent. Now, he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. So there was 12 pillars set up at the base of Mount Sinai. And all the 12 tribes were there with everybody. Then he sent young men uh, of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. So he, he builds this offer and altar and he offers up sacrifices. And the, so the people are now here at the base of the mountain. And then look what Moses did with the, the blood of these sacrifices. He took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Now, we know that the life is in the blood, and the life of an animal given on behalf of another. It's a substitutional sacrifice. And so half the blood was sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. All these laws that were written down, he's reading in front of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said we will do and we'll be obedient, right? And Moses took the blood that was in the basin, the other half, and he sprinkles it on the people. So can you imagine, there's people assembled all this would have taken a while. That's why it took basins. And he's just going, pew, pew. he's sprinkling blood on them. This is radical. And he says, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to these words. You're, you're, this is a blood oath you're making. That's so radical. He says, you're going to do it? Well, I don't want you to know how God is so serious about it. So it is a serious thing to say, oh, we're going to do the word and the law. No one could ever do it. That's what makes the covenant that Jesus makes later, so great. He's in the upper room, and he holds up the covenant. He says, now this is a new covenant with my blood, which is given for you for the removal of sin. You don't have to do anything. You have to do is trust me. Surrender your life and trust me. Man, I love that covenant. I'm so thankful for that covenant. Now, Moses went up. So Moses now goes back up on the mountain with Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. Now, did they see God in his fullness? No. How do we know that? Well, because 1 Timothy 6.16 says, God dwells in unapproachable light with whom no man has seen or can see. God even tells Moses later, you know, you know if, if you were to see me, Moses, you'd die. But they saw a portion of God's glory, like Ezekiel does, like Isaiah does in Isaiah 6, even like John does in the book of Revelation. We're told here that 
and they saw the God of Israel, that there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. So they see this reflection of glory. That's what they saw. Maybe they saw the very glassy sea described in Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation 15. But God is altogether holy and glorious. No man can see him and live. But they saw a portion of his glory. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God. And then it says they ate and they drank which is kind of an interesting thing. So they had taken some of the sacrifice with them up, and God is there showing glory, and they're eating before him. Why is that? Well, that was, fel- that was signifying fellowship with God. One of the greatest things you do in the Eastern culture, and the Jewish culture, is you sit down and you eat, and you don't, it's not fast food, it's long food. And what I mean by that is you sit down for hours and you talk. It's fellowship. In fact, when you had certain sacrifices given, the priest would give half of the food to the people, and they ate it before God. It spoke of fellowship. That's what they're doing here. And that's why Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and dine with him. God was saying, Jesus saying, I want to have fellowship with you. So that's what they were doing. They were eating before the Lord in God's presence. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So he says, I want you to come up further uh, up on the mountain. I'm going to give you these tablets of stone. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. Now Joshua, of course, will become the next leader. He will literally take the children of Israel into the promised land. And so now he's Moses' assistant. He's first learning to be a servant before he can be a leader, right? And he said to the elders, Now you wait here for us to come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and her are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to him. So Aaron and her, you're in good hands, or so we think. Yeah, it's going to lead to something bad next week. Then Moses went up on the mountain, uh, and the idea is that Joshua would have stayed a little distance from him, and a cloud covered the mountain. So now he goes to the top, and this cloud just encompasses the whole mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days, and on the seventh day he called Moses out to the midst of the cloud. Now, it says the glory rested, verse 16. The word there is Shekinah. We often use this term to speak of God's resting presence, or the fact that God would tabernacle with his people. So God's presence is tabernacling or dwelling with Moses. And it says, the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So like a volcano. I mean, there's nothing but cloud and fire coming out. The people would, would have been blown away. And they're thinking, well, I mean, how is Moses? I mean, he's going to die in there, right? So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up in the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And that becomes a problem. Because he's in this, maybe it's like a volcano. We can't fully describe it as only we have is the description here. But we know earlier the mountain was quaking. There's a cloud. There's fire. Moses goes up and now he's there 40 days and 40. He's there for a month and a half. No one hears anything from him. They assume he's dead. And that leads to the next chapter, which is disastrous. But let me close with this. Notice here, just as we close, Moses was the only one invited to go deep into the presence of God. That's it, just Moses. Now with that, I I just want to remind us that because of what Christ has done for us, it's not that way. We're told in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, that we can now come boldly before a throne of grace. So now we can come into the very, the veil has been torn, we can now come into the very presence of God to find grace and help in time of need. So it's not just one, Hey, it was Moses here in the Old Testament, and leading up to Christ's death on the cross, it was just the high priest once a year getting to go into the holiest of holies. Now we can all come into God's presence. The only question is this, do we take advantage of that? So here was Moses, was this incredible opportunity. We have that opportunity every single day. It's amazing, isn't it? We have that opportunity every single day. Let's pray.